My name's Michael, and this is All Departments. Here come the cherries, and we're heading for the top of the tree. Bournemouth is a team that's going to show Division 3. Here come the leaders and the scorers at the full Saturday. Showing how to win the Southern way. So we say, come on, Bournemouth. Come on, Bournemouth. While you're out there winning, hear the shouting and the singing. We sing, come on, Bournemouth. Come on, Bournemouth. Here come the cherries. Here come the cherries. Welcome to all departments. It's less than two weeks since the final whistle went at the den, but despite the lack of action on the pitch, there has been no shortage of activity in and around the court. We've said a fond farewell to Schwan Jalal, whilst Richard Hughes has been offered a coaching position after hanging up his boots for the second and final time. Chairman Jeff Mostyn's frequent appearances on TV and radio have left hearts in mouths as he indicated that we might one day have to leave Kings Park to accommodate a growing but as yet untapped fan base. Whilst Cherries fans David Whitehead and Adrian Leave received well-deserved VIP tickets to the FA Cup final itself after organising the Burton Albion Coach Fund back in January. And the transfer tittle-tattle has been in full swing with Lewis Graben, Steve Cook, Dan Gosling and Adam Lalana making the early running. Like all football clubs, our Cherries have had many different captains over the years. From Mark Newsom to Adam Barrett, the list is long and in some cases glorious. One man who has recently placed himself firmly in the highest echelons of legendary leaders at the court is Tommy Elphick. And I'm delighted to say he joins us now on the phone. Tommy, welcome to all departments. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So the season's just ended about a week or so ago. And at the time after the Millwall game, there was probably a slight air of disappointment after we lost that game and our playoff push just came up short. Now you've had a little bit of time to reflect. How would you sum it up overall? No, you, you've got to be really happy. Um, I think, uh, obviously, immediately at the start, we, we made a good start, but um, after probably sort of October time, we, we didn't win as many games as we'd liked and seemed to be at the wrong end of the table. So to finish where we finished was, was a remarkable achievement. And, I think as, as the fans and, and everybody who's watched us could see that we was improving week on week. Um, and, and as you say, it was, it was a little bit disappointing to miss out on on the playoffs, especially watching on, because I felt we could have perhaps um, set the playoffs alight and, and give people to think, something to think about and, and been a force and, and you know gone, gone right to the wire. So as you say, it was a little bit of a disappointing end, but on the whole, it, it's, it's a, it was a brilliant season and, and obviously one that's going to go down in history. Definitely set quite a few records this season. During mm. the autumn, we had a bit of a, a difficult run and mm. we dropped down, I think, to 19th. We never actually went in the relegation zone. At that yep. time, uh, the players and the manager were still stoically sticking to the, to the mm. passing style and there was probably a little bit of concern amongst the fans who was going to work out it did in the end did you and the rest of the players always have faith that that was the way to go yeah I think so um, we we sort of got promoted doing it um, you know even the season before we, we'd had a five game spell where we didn't win uh, I think we might have even lost all five on, on, on the spin didn't we and, and we got stuck to our principles and that saw us through that time so there was no reason to panic and, and change anything drastically um, this time around, um, I just think it was more a little bit of a, a naivety, and maybe the good start sort of was was our own fault in them games. You know, I think maybe we thought not got above our station, but but we we probably got a little bit too confident and and became a little bit naive as, as a result of that. And as I said before, we we definitely learned from from those early experiences, and I think you could tell sort of as the, as the season went on, we, we we put them into practice. So. We never once doubted what we was about or or our philosophies. I think when you come and watch Bournemouth, you, you see an identity and, and you see a way that Bournemouth play. And you don't get that with, with too many teams um, in England. And 
and that's a, a lot of credit has to go to the gaffer and, and his and his team for that. Yeah, the players and obviously the fans have a lot of faith in the manager. Things mm-hmm. begin to turn around or begin to turn around December time. I went to the mm-hmm. game away at Reading, which seemed like a massive result at the time. And although we didn't go on a tremendous run for a while mm-hmm. after that, we seem to just be picking up results, even getting points away in difficult mm-hmm. circumstances. Did you feel at that time that everybody was finding their feet in the division? Yeah, yeah, that, that, that felt as though that was a sort of turning point for us and, and give us a platform to, to work from and, and a, a base and, and a standard that we set ourselves to, to again. Um, and it, it was a result, not not just because of um, getting a result away from home at a time where we where we needed to get a result, but it was against a big team and it was a big scout because Redden had, had gone a long time without losing at home and I think everybody just grew from that game and, and took it on and again we learned from the experience and, and managed to win a few more away after that so I definitely think that that was one of the main turning points of the season yeah and from then on it was basically another great season and we set a, a record breaking season for the club on Manny mm. and, and another great season for you personally but just to go back to the start of the season it didn't start brilliantly for you I remember going to the, yeah. the very first game at home to Charlton and been amazed to see that yeah. you were in the starting eleven, and then you only featured intermittently really over the first couple of months. That must have been a difficult time. Mm. Yeah, it was, it was a huge blow, um, especially after the season I had before. Um, so I had a good season, and, and sort of the, you don't have no you had no right in football. But you know, I thought I well, just sort of had to get myself to to a fit standard in pre-season, and that I'd probably be starting. But it wasn't meant to be. Um, just from a personal point of view, it was, it was actually when I come to Bournemouth, I was off the back of a, a very long injury, mm. and uh, it was the first pre-season that I'd fully completed, and it, it took its toll on me. I wasn't quite as, as sharp as I'd like to have been, and as quite as ready as some of the others, and it just took me a little bit longer to, to get where I needed to be to, to get playing to the standards that I set myself the season before. So, um, although I was I was disappointed, there was there was no real panic and no knee-jerk reaction to be made because I always had faith in, in my ability and always had faith in, in what the manager had thought of me and, and what he had told me under them circumstances. So it was a hard start, but I always talk about the dressing room and, and the direction we, we want to be going in. And if your captain don't set them standards, then, then nobody follows. So it was important that I showed, them, showed the good side out and, and got myself back in the team as quickly as possible. And is it difficult? I imagine it is when you are only coming in and out of the team. Sometimes you were coming on a sub, yeah. playing every week. It must be difficult mm. to get into the flow of the game as quickly. It must be yeah. rusty. Yeah, especially for a centre-half because they're so far and few between them sort of substitute appearances and 20 minutes here and there aren't going to do you no, no sort of no good in, in the long run. So for me, I always talk about the rhythm that I need to get to get up to standard and, and the fitness and you only get that by playing week in, week out and you can't replicate that in training or, or really in reserve games these days. So it is hard, but um, you know, you just have to never doubt yourself and, and continue to work as, as hard as possible and, and try and improve where, where need be. And you spoke about being the captain still during that period, even though more often yeah. than not Simon Francis was leading the team yeah. out. Um, yeah. Would you ever have considered resigning the captaincy if you hadn't got back into the team you kind of got in around November I think but did that ever go through your head? Um, no not really I think it's it's a hard it was a real hard one because of my age um, I, I wanted to be playing every week and looking back now it, it, it was only really a short spell that I wasn't playing but it's different if you've got a club captain that's, that's sort of on the wrong side of 30 and, and coming towards the end then it probably takes it a little bit easier, if you like, um, and probably finds it easier to to be that captain still and, and to be that leader. But when when you're when you're um, not in the side, the, the mindset changes a little bit, um, and, and you are frustrated on a on a Friday leading up to the game. And the worst feeling is on a Saturday after the game, when, especially away when when you haven't been involved and everybody's talking about the game, and you can't really get involved in them conversations. You know, it's it's hard and. Every footballer can can relate to that, but to 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 have sort of asked the captaincy to be taken away from me would have been a ridiculous thing to do because this this group is is such a good group and and the gaffer sort of relies on me with that and and has 
put a lot of trust and faith in me in, in carrying the armband. So um, I take a lot of pride and honour out of that. And, and for me to throw that away would have, would have been stupid, really. When you became the captain, I think you replaced Miles Addison. How were you yeah. told that you were going to be the new captain? And after that, was it awkward with Miles? No, not at all. Mark Miles is a he's a close friend of mine, and I get on really well with Miles. And unfortunately for Miles, he, he was going through a difficult period with with injuries and and a few other things. He wasn't playing quite as regularly as he'd like to have done. And um, obviously there was there was an off field incident that everyone knew about. So I think for him it was it was almost a weight off his shoulders to to not have that responsibility. He needed to concentrate on himself and 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 get as fit as possible and and. You know, be a little bit selfish in, in some circumstances. So he, he was fully supportive of it, and, and he backed me as much as everybody else did. But um, just getting told the gaffer sort of pulled me before uh, we was on an away game. Just pulled me in a we go for a walk before the game. He just pulled me in and let me. So it was, as I say, it's, it's uh, one of the lead Bournemouth out, especially this group of players. So one of the greatest moments in my career, really. As captain. What extra mm. duties do you have to fulfil before and after a game? Do you have to do a little bit more than when you were not the captain? Um, possibly, yeah. There's, there's little sort of things like this that you, you find yourself doing more of. Um, a little bit more press, if you like. And, and uh, there's sort of little duties before the game with, with the referees. But I always said, like, whether I'm captain or not, it doesn't change me as a player. I, I try to lead by example and... And, and try to be a, a leader regardless. That's, that's an important thing for a centre half to do. Um, but as you say, not, not a lot of changes really. So I'm, I'm blessed that we've got some good older pros that, that like to carry a bit of responsibility as well. So it's it's, uh, it's an easy job with the group we've got. And in January this year, you led us out against your hometown club, Brighton, and yeah. your boyhood club, Liverpool, both in the same month. Um, so yeah. the Brighton game, was it strange to begin the year in those circumstances? Uh, yeah, it was, yeah. Um, it was obviously a fixture that I looked out for from, from the start. Um, sort of my career at Brighton was sort of cut, started with a bang and, and carried on from strength to strength and, until I got hit with a bad injury. So I always felt I had a little bit more to, to fulfil at Brighton. Um, I was one of the first players, well, I was the first player to be contracted to the Amex and at the time, you know, I was I was quite young and, and doing well, and there's a bit of speculation that I might be leaving. Um, but decided to sort of commit my future to Brighton, and they felt the dream of of le- leading Brighton out at the Amex. So that was always the the, the long term goal when when I signed that contract. And, and unfortunately for me, with the injury, that that didn't quite happen. And to be leading another team out at the Amex was was quite surreal. But it was um it was a nice moment really um, to be doing it with with the team that I'm in now was was a, a big, big thing for me because, you know, it's a, it's a great dressing room and, as you say, we, we keep setting records and, and we're going from strength to strength. So I keep saying it is an honour, but it, it really is. And did you have a lot of family and friends at the game? And if so, were they backing you or were they all uh, Brighton fans? No, they're, they're 100% behind me. Um, they're, 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 um, they're my fans as opposed to football fans, if you like. They're, they're a great support network and especially in the dark times, you know, that's when they come really strong for me and, and every sort of good footballer has, has a good background, you know, and a, and a good support network. So, um, they, they was definitely in the Bournemouth camp that day. <laughs> I'm glad to hear it. And yeah. moving on to the Liverpool game, leading up to that game in the FA Cup, there was quite a bit of speculation that they would play a weakened team. And I remember mm. looking at Twitter when I was on the bus going up to Dean Court with my son on the way to the match and pretty much all their star players were on the team sheet. You and the rest yeah. of the players must have been delighted. Yeah, you have to be, um, especially like with the, the age group of our squad, everyone's progressing and, and looking to play at the highest level possible. So to test yourself uh, against Liverpool's first team as opposed to the, the second team, if you like, is, is what everybody wanted. And I think we come out of the game with, with a lot of credit and, and a lot of plaudits and that sort of opened everybody's eyes to, to what Bournemouth are about and I think after that again we talk about the Reading game as, as being a platform but after the Liverpool game we really went on a on a fine run so that, that gives us a lot of confidence and was a big part in our season. Yeah, it really felt like that game went some mm. way to putting us on the map because after the game I spoke to quite a few people who don't go and watch us play but live in the area yeah. and of course they'd seen yeah. it on the TV and they were full of confidence yeah. whereas prior to that even though we've been doing well recently they were 
they were still treating this as a bit of a joke and going on about their Premier League mm. teams. But when yep. you came off the pitch, there's a few Liverpool fans in our squad. I think Lewis Graben, you know, Kane, yep. Steve Cook. I don't, I don't think you played that day, and yourself. Was there a yep. was 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 there a few elbows out trying to get Steven Gerrard shirt, or were you all uh, peaceful? No, to be fair, we, we was all, I think we were all more disappointed about losing. That says a lot about what we're about, you know. Um, the last thing on our minds was, was taking people's shirts. We, we, we was, it was all about winning the game, and um, I don't think actually anybody swapped a shirt on the day because um, of the disappointment of, of not going through. So um, looking back on it, it would have been nice to sort of get one of them shirts, especially with how well Liverpool have done this season. But unfortunately, that, the, the sort of disappointment of losing overrode that, that sort of thought, you know. When I saw the stats after the game, you had a brilliant game. You you won 100% of mm. your challenges, even though you're playing yeah. up against Daniel Sturridge, Luis Suarez, I think mm. Team Sterling came on a little bit later. Yeah. What was that like? No, it's, it's, it's good. Obviously, these players, that uh, the, the publicity they get these days, they're, they're superstars and, and rightly so. Someone like Luis Suarez is He's obviously in the top three at the world at the moment, and to, to pitch yourself in against him is, is a great experience, and it's, it's nice to see how far you you are off. Um, as I said before, like a lot of people still look at Bournemouth as, as a small club, and it's it's games like the Liverpool ones and, and the Real Madrid ones that, that get so much coverage that help us to change that perspective and and keep helping us raise our stock as, as a club and try to get more people involved and and, and more fans involved. So. All, the, all these games are, are, are a real good um, opportunity to show what we're about and and, and to, to drag a few more people along to, to try and come and watch us. Yeah, well, the ground was by and large full, especially towards mm. the end of the season. Um, prior yeah. to the Liverpool game, we had to come through the rearranged third round tie with Burton Albion. And you scored yep. your first goal, I think, yeah. of the season in that one. And yeah. aside from from the finish, which was at a pretty narrow angle, as I recall, the thing I was most impressed with was the way you you wheeled away with your finger in the air as if you were a twenty goal <laughs> season striker. Uh, even yeah. players that uh, that score regularly lose their minds for a, a few seconds after they <laughs> score, like Mark Pugh springs to mind. But you seem to stay cool as a cucumber. Why do you think that is? Uh, it's just nice to get a rest. I think. I think a lot of people sprint to do all these celebrations, and they're, they're not really in my nature. I just prefer to get a breather and, and collect my thoughts so um, often talk about sort of the psychology of the game and, and that's one thing that I've tried to adapt to in my game is, is that little window of opportunity to, to freshen up and, and again gather my thoughts and, and think about sort of winning the game or pushing on whatever the situation is so that's something that's been instilled in me when I was quite young and, and I continue to do to now so that's probably why Because you didn't get much chance to do any running after the header against QPR because you were no. robbed, weren't you? <laughs> yeah, that was a good moment. Um, obviously, it was a massive game for us, Harry coming back, and we was making this late charge, and, and QPR seemed to be sort of slipping up. But the amount of talent, just watching them now, and, and the amount of talent that they've got in their team, it, it's pretty ridiculous to, to be playing in the championship. So to score against uh, them and, and, and sort of, I think it was to take us in front was, was a big moment in, in my season. Yeah, Robert Green as well. He was in golf for England in the last World Cup when it started. So, you know, yeah, far we've come. Uh, another thing that's made yeah. a big hit with the fans at Dean Court is the goalpost ritual before the game. Mm. I sit in the family stand, and it's always one right. of my favourite parts of the match day when you finish up doing your thing at the goalpost and you do a little sprint over to where we are in the main stand, yeah. and the crowd are all shouting your name and you give us a little clap. What what's it like for you during those moments? I buzz off them sort of moments. It's, it's, um, I, I love like uh, the the atmosphere and, and playing in the big bat and when you hear your name being sung. So I, I love all that and it's good to. I think it's good to have a connection with the fans and, and to get them on side. Um, I think when we when we sort of, when we talk about being caught being full towards the end of the season, it it made a big difference to our performances and, and give that spark that we needed to start games fast and and this need be to try and get the winner. So. I think it's a good opportunity to, to try and sort of spur the fans up and, and get them on board and get them where we need to be. So it's it's, uh, it's a nice moment, yeah. Yeah, we absolutely love it. And you always miss yeah. the photo when the team yeah. line up because I think you went in one and then after that, I, think, yeah. I don't know what you thought, but I got the impression you thought, hang on, I think I'm doing my 
routine at the goalpost is a bit more important to my performance than being yeah. in a photo. Does um, yeah. Steve Cook, who's the namesake, obviously, of your your defensive partner, Steve Cook, the photographer, yeah. has he ever said anything to you about it? No, I think he, he wanted to do a photo just to me on my own just to try and get it superimposed on the others. I'm not sure what they've got planned for him, but I think I might have ruined that now. I think they're <laughs> going to make a big montage of him, but... As I say, uh, 10 players don't look as good as 11, so I <laughs> might have to sort that out with a little individual photo. But as I say, I'm, I'm, I'm really superstitious, and, and after I did that one one time, there was, there was no chance that I was going in for any more. So I'm, I'm sorry to Steve. No, it seems to <laughs> Probably be cost trick. him a few quid. <laughs> yeah. And I read, actually, in the programme, one of the programmes, mm. you were quite superstitious. Do you have any superstitions outside yeah. of football? Um, no, not in not in everyday life, but it's sort of just leading up to games and that, doing certain routines in the dressing room. And it's crazy that there's quite a few of us in in the dressing room. I think Chad Daniels is, is quite superstitious, Brett Pittman. So it's a thing with footballers. I think a lot of footballers are. Um, if, it, if it brings you some sort of comfort and, and uh, brings you some sort of mental state where, where you think you can perform better, then I'm all for it. So it seems to work for me up until now. So I won't be stopping. No, I think most fans can relate to that. We've all got one session yeah. or another on match yeah. day. You've been with us for a couple of seasons and there's been yeah. lots of highs and one or two lows. One low that sticks out for us as fans was the game away at Milton Keynes Dons in February last year when Ryan yeah. Lowe was sent off for an outrageous challenge on you. I looked at it again yeah. today, actually. Yeah. I don't remember it being that bad. Just tell us a bit yeah. about what happened both during the match between the two you before he was actually sent off, because I think there was a bit of, a mm. bit of verbals during the game, and then subsequently with yeah. him contacting you to apologise afterwards. Yeah, uh, no, I, I, I've played against him many times and never really seen that side of him. Um, I think, again, they, they were sort of challenging to, to try and get in the playoffs, and, and we was in a position where we was just about to go above him, I think. And it was quite a highly charged game. Um, I don't think he's having the best of times and, and I could see he's getting a little bit frustrated and um, I remember sort of playing me and Frano played our way out of the corner in, in the sort of towards the corner flag and he come in a little bit late and I sort of reacted just said to him in whatever what you're doing and all that and he sort of bit quite hard so um, he seemed to be a bit of a man possessed of that situation and I didn't, didn't really think nothing of it and then the next thing you know he's coming flying in with that tackle which Looking back, I was, I was lucky, you know, I was pretty blessed that, that day because it could have been a lot, lot worse. Um, and as it turns out, it nearly was after going to see a specialist. It, it, was, it was nearly quite bad, so I was, as I say, very, very lucky. Mm. Um, but he, as a, he, he did contact me, as everybody knows, and, and apologised, and, and the manager contacted me and, and apologised on behalf of the club, and I believe their chairman had, had rung our chairman, so... It's one of them things in football, you can't quite explain it and, and there's no rhyme or reason for it, but it's, it's put to bed now and, and fortunately I haven't, I haven't got no long-lasting memories of it. So, as I say, it's, it's done now. Apart from me bringing it up again. Yeah, obviously, I think it, and you, you never get rid of that and, and the pictures of it and all the rest of it, but at the moment I look, at, look back on it and think I was quite lucky, so I, I definitely got away with one that day. And I, it sounds like the contacting the player afterwards, you know, it was yourself in that case or whoever it is, and the club's getting in touch is standard mm. practice. Have you ever been on the other side of that? Have you ever had to contact no. the player to, to apologise? No, no, no. I'm, I'm sort of, I'm, I'm not that sort of player. I, I try not to get myself in, in them situations. So up to now, I haven't, I haven't had to do it and, and hopefully can't see myself ever having to do it. So, no. Yeah, let's hope that continues. Now, at this time of yeah. year, there's always a lot of column inches to fill and a lot of speculation about player moves and contracts. There's been yeah. quite a bit of talk, hot air, whatever you want to call it, about Lewis Graben recently. Is it strange mm. as a footballer that your terms of employment, which most people would consider to be a private matter, are discussed so casually and so openly by thousands of people yeah. that you don't even really know? Yeah, it's it's crazy. Um, football's got it's, it's it's just gone ridiculous now. Um, you sign a four year contract, it might as well be a three year contract these days because it leaves the player with, with a lot of power, only having a year left on their contract. So it's it's something not many people that they they get to know how they get to know. I'm I'm not quite sure, um, but it's it's part and part of the game and. 
Lewis has been an absolute massive player for us this year and, and I just hope that we, we can keep hold of him and, and keep developing him and, and he keeps developing us and, and helping us because I honestly think if, if we can keep the squad together and, and just have one or two bits of quality then, then we'll go very close next year. And do the players discuss things like contracts amongst themselves? Because in, in my job, in most places of work, many mm. things will be discussed but that yeah. isn't. People don't talk about you know, their pay or whatever. No. Things are kind of a little bit uh, too close yeah. to the phone. So do you discuss that? Yeah, no, or? Sure. No, same, same. Um, you've never sort of asked somebody how much they're earning or what they're not earning. Um, it's often and spoke about how long you've got left in, in on your contract because you can sort of relate to things like that and, and you never know, you might be wanting to buy a house and you've only got a year left on your contract. It's hard and them sort of things are spoke about. Um, but, but in terms of, of pay and, and stuff like that, no, it's, it's, it's very private and that's, that's kept to, to yourself, you know. You must talk about what other players are earning, like in the Premier League. The ones yeah. that flashed all over the paper, like when Rooney signed his new contract, where it's three hundred thousand yeah. a week. You must all chat about yeah. that. Yeah, we do. Um, and obviously, you, you get to know about what people are, are earning in, in sort of similar positions to you at, at different clubs. But one thing I would say about all this, sort of, a lot of it is is talked up. Um, a lot of it is agents. A lot of agents put in like throw stuff out in the papers and just to try and raise their players' stock. Um, so I think if you ever read how much someone's earning half it and, and you'd be closer, you know? <laughs> it's yeah. always going to be more than I'm earning. Anyway, I just wanted to go yeah. back to when you were uh, a young lad. I think you, yeah. you grew up in Brighton. Tell us about yeah. the progress that you made as a schoolboy, if you can remember. You don't need obviously all the details. And then how you finally found yourself on a contract yeah. with Brighton. I mean, you must have stood out at school when you were a footballer. Yeah, I, I don't think I started playing until I was 11 or 12, which is, is quite late now these days. Um, and, and signed football and quite quickly after that, I'm going to sort of local schoolboy trials and, and getting picked up from there from by someone called Martin Inchwood, who, who went on to manage Brighton. And I think he's at Pompey now. He's quite a big figure in the game. Um uh, come through sort of the the, the schoolboy forms at, at Brighton, and, and I was very lucky to to be in a very very good youth team. Um, we seemed to be sort of breaking records and winning so many games, and 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 a lot of us I think there was eleven of us. It was sort of one of the most ever, I think, if not the most ever for Brighton that they had kept on as, as apprentices. Mm. Um, and again, winning leagues, and we had a really good run in the FA Youth Cup, got to the semi final. Um, and we got knocked out on penalties to, to Newcastle at St James's Park. Mm-hmm. Um, the team had Andy Carroll in, uh, Tim Krull, uh, Kazenga Lawalawa. There was there was loads that went on to make it. Um, so it was sort of around that time that I made my baby for Brighton. There was sort of one or two of us that was standing out. Me, um, I have a centre half, Joel Lynch, who, who's now at Huddersfield, um, and a few others. And, and a lot of us went on to to. to sign a pro form and, and then there, there's probably about four or five of us probably less than that now that are, are still in the pro game so as I, said, I, was, I was very lucky um, had some, some great coaches and, and managers in, in my youth team days and I'm lucky to be playing at the level I am and, and to have played so many games so I'm quite happy with what I've done up to now you know and I know you support Liverpool but were you a Brighton yeah. fan did you go and watch them play much when you were younger yeah, I did. Um, I was sort of Liverpool was my first team, but um, Brighton were the team that I would, I'd go and watch, and, and I'd be lying if I if I said I wasn't a fan, and, and I'm still a fan, you know. Um, so it's a great club, and uh, it's, it's run by some some great people. There's still some great people there that I know, and you know, always, always look out for their results. So yeah, they 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 was the team that I went and watched, and tried to watch players in in my position and, and learn off them. And how well. Did you know Steve Cook when you were Bronx? I know he's a little bit younger than you. You must have seen him come up through the ranks. Yeah, I think um, I was sort of in the first team and, and, and Cookie was coming up. Um, and I remember we, we played in the Carling Cup against Man City just as they got taken over by by the uh, the current owners and, and there was a lot of money and they were getting branded as the richest team in football. And, uh, it was around January time they'd signed a couple of players and, and we ended up beating them. And Cookie made his debut because I remember he had a long throw and, and they brought him on late to, to sort of get the ball in the box. But 
Um, he was always in and around the first team and, and training quite a bit, but never quite making the next step to the first team. Um, and then I remember him coming on loan to Bournemouth after we had just got our new owner and thought this could be a great move for Cookie. Um, and then he got recalled to, to play in one game against Southampton and, and, and done really well. And I believe Brighton wanted to keep him, but Bournemouth had put a bid in for him. And, and he went, and I thought, that's that's a big statement for him to leave home, go to a club that, that aren't as big as, as Brighton at the moment, and to try and get football away from home is a big statement. So I always took an interest in his career and looked to see how he was doing. And, and from what I read and, and heard, he he gone on to do really well and when I come back to Bournemouth and, and signed I, I was surprised at how much he had improved um, he was always a really good player at Brighton but there was one or two that they maybe sort of kept putting ahead of him and, and I knew, knew he was getting frustrated and it, it'll definitely say now that the best thing he ever done was, was leave, leave Brighton and, and come to Bournemouth which, which wasn't an easy decision at the time no, he's done a great job since he's yeah. come down here much like yourself I just wanted to clear up what happened in the game in October 2010 when we were playing Brighton at the Withdean? You were in the Brighton defence that day yeah. and we won a penalty in the last yeah. minute. I must have watched that clip back about 10 times and I yeah. still can't tell who handled the ball, although yeah. I've got a suspicion it might have been Steve Fletcher. And, yeah. uh, I think it, was, it almost definitely was outside the area. Can you clip that? Yeah. yeah, no, definitely. I think we both might have touched it. Um, but uh, I remember Fletch coming on and knew what he was all about and basically tried to get my arm above his shoulder to stop him jumping, but he still jumped and both of our arms went up in the air and I, we definitely both touched it and it was a good two or three yards outside the <laughs> box. But all I can remember is Pewey taking the penalty and he had some rascal red boots on. Um, but it, it won't be a game that I'll forget because they actually dropped me the game after which I thought was a little bit harsh, but... Yeah, nightmare. <laughs> so you weren't secretly doing it as a kind of long-term <laughs> nah. strategy to secure a move to Team Core? Yeah, yeah. I forget. It. Was it Bradbury the manager at the time? I think it might have been. I, I do remember yeah. being amazed that the penalty was given. I, I wasn't at the yeah. game. I watched it on the telly, so I saw a few replays then because it was televised, wasn't it? And uh, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, obviously, I didn't really know about you then, and 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 yeah. I just couldn't believe they gave it. We were yeah, we no, really but... felt like we got out of jail because you were one 0 up, and, and it ended up being a draw, didn't it? Yeah, and it was quite was was we top and Bournemouth for second, I think, as well. It was quite a quite a big game early on in the season. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure we we were top and you for second. Yeah. Well, so justice was done overall, and then yeah. obviously you came to us a couple of years after that, or just just under a couple of years after that. Just tell us about, or what you can tell us about how the move came about. Yeah, um, the, the, that season, the same season as when I get the penalty away, we we won the league, um, and as a sort of present or gesture for us winning the league, that Brighton took us away for a week at the end of the between the end last game and second to last game for a sort of rest and a bit of training in um, Marbella, I think it was. Um, and then come back and we played Notts County away and, and uh, got to about 40 minutes in the game and, and I injured myself and, and knew it was quite bad. Um, and, and sort of following that, it turned out that I, I ruptured my Achilles, so mm. I was, was set for a bit of time out. Um, had the operation done the next day and, and as it turns out it wasn't quite right and, and ended up missing uh, about 16 months I think it was um, so I sort of got over that and, and was ready for the next pre-season the one where I actually ended up joining Bournemouth um, and we was out in Spain I think we was out in Spain we was actually up the road from where Bournemouth were training pre-season mm. and we'd, we'd, we were playing Pompey um and I believe that someone from Bournemouth had come and watched, maybe. Um, and the agent rang me that evening and said, you've had an offer to, to go on loan to Bournemouth. Um, do you fancy it? And I said, well, yeah. And then when I got back, it turned out I had about five or six different clubs that, that wanted to take me on loan for the first half of the season. Um, so I sat down with, with Gus Poirier, um, discussed what he wanted to do. And he said, well, I think it's a great idea. Go, go get sort of 10, 15, 20 games and, and come back and, for the second half of the season <clears throat> um, so I was preparing to come down to Bournemouth to meet Paul Groves at the time mm. um, and, and on the journey down my agent rang me and 
said uh, they don't want to take you on loan anymore, they want to sign you. Um, so I saw all these things down through my head. I met my agent down here, my, my dad come down me, we met Paul Groves and, and had a look around and, and everything seemed good, went back and I thought I'd been at Brighton for so long, uh, played 200 games, I was on the back of a, a bad injury and the, the free centre arse who, who were playing at the moment were, were doing really well and for me to get back in the team I needed to get out and play football. Um, so my immediate thought after speaking to the manager back at Brighton was, was that was the way forward. Um, but then Bournemouth got through and, and, and sort of again sold another dream to me and, and a vision and and I went into it really and, and, and as soon as they sort of presented me with, with that there, there was only one decision and that was coming down on the permanent. Yeah, it was the right decision from our point of view but we went through quite a difficult spell in mm. terms of results in the first well, 10 or so games yeah. you started playing with us and yeah. fans were quite mutinous and in the end Paul Groves lost his job. What was it like mm. in the dressing room during, <coughs> during that time? It, it wasn't good. Um, I've got to say, I've got to give Paul Groves a, a lot of credit because he assembled a lot of the squad that are still together now and a great guy, great coach, but unfortunately just didn't work out for him for, for whatever reasons. Um, but he, he does deserve a lot of credit. Um, but as you say, the dressing room, he was a tough one because there were so many new lads no one really knew where they could go to speak, who they could speak to, and it was hard. Um, and we needed something or, or someone to, to come in and, and give us a kick up the backside, really, pull us together and, and give us a sense of direction. And, and that's exactly what the gaffer did. Um, and, and off the back of that, you, you've seen some big characters and, and big leaders come out in a dressing room and a lot of our success is down to that. So... As I say, Paul Groves deserves a, a lot of credit for, for bringing them characters in. But as I say, it needed someone to, to give us a purpose and, and a sense of direction. So we, we was blessed to, to have Eddie Howe and, and, and Jace come back, really. Just going back to that time, there must be a lot of frustration amongst mm. the players. Is it difficult not to yeah. let that come out in public, for example, on the pitch, or and particularly when... Mm you're interviewed is it difficult to yeah. to give the uh to give the straight bat say the right things and not find yourself you know putting your foot in your mouth and and, and causing a kind of media storm yeah it is um and as i say, a lot of people have made a commitment to, to come down here and, and give this a right go and we was all getting really frustrated and, and we wasn't getting a lot of luck and uh, things were going against this big style and Sort of even from a personal point of view, I'm sort of looking at it going, bloody hell, Brighton are flying in the Championship. I, I could have been going back to that. And I'm here stuck. We, we were stuck in a rut. And I'll be honest, it wasn't a nice place to, to come in every day. And it wasn't a nice place to, to play on a Saturday because the fans were negative. The players were really negative in their approach. And it was just breeding throughout everyone. And I remember the, the day the gaffer come back and, and the lift that everyone had got and the buzz that, that come around the stadium and all of a sudden you think, well, this, this ain't a bad place to play football when it's <laughs> like this. And all of a sudden one win turns into two and two turns into three and you're on this amazing run and, and we haven't looked back. But it is frustrating not to sort of voice an opinion and, and tell people what you're thinking. But the, the Paul Groves and, and Sean Brooks were, were great guys and, and they didn't deserve that. They, they they were good people and, and good football people and unfortunately for them they just couldn't get out what they wanted to get out on on into the lads and and, and ultimately we we couldn't perform how they wanted us to perform as well so it was it was a real frustrating time yeah yeah fans obviously are relatively unforgiving when it comes to mm. results and Paul Groves didn't have the relationship with the fans yeah. that the other managers might have had. For example, when Eddie and you and the rest of the team lost those five games on the bounce last season, I think mm -hmm. it was probably around the time you were injured after the Ryan Lowe tackle, but yes. um, there was not even a hint of mutiny amongst the fans yeah. because we had had a long lasting love of the manager and obviously his yeah. return had been a massive thing. He'd done really well for us before. So it kind of depends on the circumstances. Whereas with Paul Groves, it was, he was never really in the fans' hearts. But I remember, no. I remember my son, uh, he's seven now, so he would have been uh, 
six then, I think, crying at the end of the Warsaw yeah. game. And he couldn't really understand yeah. why we hadn't won. And then there's these rumours mm. that Eddie Howe was coming back. And my son didn't know who Eddie Howe was. I said, don't worry, he comes back. Everything's going to be fine. Yeah. And I was I kind of had my fingers crossed behind my back that that would be the case. Yeah. And uh, he, Eddie just kind of seemed, I mean, obviously, this is what you see from a fan's perspective. He seemed to come in, like you say, it gave the place a lift. He seemed to wave his wand and everything was all right. Were you and the players who hadn't worked with him before impressed straight away? Yeah. Um, never forget his first meeting. Uh, he pulled us all into a big room and, and sort of had a PowerPoint. Um, and it was a presentation for about 10, 15 minutes of how things are going to work, where we need to be, what times we need to be there. Um, uh, if you're in the side, this is what happened. If you're on the bench, this is. And if you're out the side, this is what happened. And from then, it was like that. As I talk about that, that sense of direction and, and that purpose, and it felt like we had it from from minute one. Um, and and from all that serious stuff, he then took us for a walk down the beach and started introducing himself to everyone. We all sat down, had a coffee, and you know he was asking people for their opinions on not just football, everything. You know, asking them if they got family, and everyone created a bond with him. Um, so we always felt that, that you know this is this is now right for us and this is right for him and, and that connection, as I say, was was there from minute one and, and everyone was pulling in the same direction. Uh, he brought a competitive streak to, to training and, and a winning mentality, which you could see on a Saturday. Um, so it was a it was a great moment and, and the buzz around the ground as well. That that gives the boys this because the players didn't change too much. But it was just a little bit of confidence that we was lacking it, a little bit of that direction, and, and all of a sudden it all kicked into place, and we we done wonders to get promoted. Yeah, we went on a really good, almost record-breaking run after that, and then obviously yeah. we were promoted to the championship only the second time in our history. What mm. was it like in the dressing room after the Carlisle game when we were all but promoted? You must have been absolutely cock a hoop. Yeah, it was, it was quite emotional as well. For, for me, it was... Uh, I, I did, looking back, I, I took a, a, a gamble coming down here and I always believed in coming down here and, and then all of a sudden things are, are going horribly wrong and, and you can't win a game and it was horrible. You know, I'm trying to get back home as, as much as possible and don't want to go off and, and training wasn't what I expected and then all of a sudden you, you're not playing as well as you want and you find yourself stuck in the rut and then you go on this amazing winning run. Uh, for me, I've been injured and we lose five games and then you come back and then all of a sudden I'll come back and the lads are winning and then I'm back in the side and we're winning. It's, it's, it is a roller coaster, and, and that's all emotionally draining. Um, physically as well, you put so much into the season to, to get promoted after that amount of games. is It's the ultimate feeling and, and it was it was a fantastic moment and we really do it against all, all the odds after, after the start we made. So... It, it's one that I'm sure most Bournemouth fans are never going to forget. Right, definitely not. We've had, uh, yeah. we've had plenty of dark times, so we're really trying to make the yeah. most of, of the better times. You were lucky yeah. enough to be promoted at Brighton as mm. well. Was it a case of the second time around, like you said, you'd been through a little bit more, you had your injury, yeah. Um, yeah. and then there were some tough times at the start of your spell with us. So were you yeah. kind of in a way, able to savour the moment a little bit more because of those things? Yeah. Yeah, um, first time round with, with Brighton, we, we, we blitzed the league um, with, with secure promotion with, with sort of, I think it was about eight games to go or something stupid. So, um, emotionally, it wasn't as much of a roller coaster. but as you say, coming down here off the back of a, a long injury and sort of doubting whether you're going to play again and, and, and then doubting whether you're going to get back to the, the standards that you set yourself before and, and when you do and, and, and the team start winning and you start making some great friends in the dressing room and, and you know, I always talk about the dressing room, but there's people in there that, that you would go to war with and, and that you would back to the hills because it really is a special group and, and we need to keep this group together. And that emotional roller coaster was just felt was so intense the second time round. And when we'd done it, it, it was just fantastic. It was a, it, it, it was a, Unfortunate that we couldn't win the league, but the way our season was going, it couldn't all be perfect, could it? <laughs> no, absolutely not. I think most uh, most fans have easily settled for that at the start yeah. of the season. Now, we talked about probably the first half of the season that's just finished. Yeah. It was really in the second half of the season, and obviously in March, when 
we started yeah. to, well, it felt certainly from a fan's point of view, sitting in the stands, we were just blowing teams off the park and you yeah. know, racking up big scores. It really felt like that all started, I think it was the first, the very first day of March when we beat, beat mm. Doncaster 5-0 and then we went on to see off teams like Birmingham, Leeds, which was a big one for the fans, Reading. The confidence... Yeah in the dressing room at that point it must have been sky high yeah it, it felt um, it felt the same as as the season before when he was winning on that amazing money and we, we often spoke we said you know this is this is similar to what we was getting last year you know we're on to something we're, we're going to do this um, so the frustration that you talked about earlier of not doing it is, is quite it is really frustrating and disappointing and still now it's sort of leaving a bit of a taste in my mouth that we, we should have got over the line but <laughs> You know, we're a young group and we've got a long way to go and, and we'll get there. But that that feeling when, when you get that confidence and, and that buzz in the dressing room and everybody trusts himself and everybody's on the right path and you're all pushing in the same direction whether you're playing or you're not playing, it's a special thing and it, it's a powerful thing. And when you've got that, that dressing room and, and you've got the fans behind you and you've got a manager like you've got and, and an owner like you've got, there's, there's only one way and, and that's up. So... There's so many exciting times ahead for this club. If, if we can just keep everyone together and stay grounded and, and, and remain focused, then there's, there's a big future here. Just going on to talk about, I mean, you might not want to reveal too much, but the kind of things that footballers get up to during the closed season. Do you have to make yeah. sure that you watch what you eat? Do you have to yeah, make yeah, too much to drink, keep yourself in trim? Do you have yeah. a summer programme or anything like that? Yeah, yeah, we do. Um, I think the, the the length of the season, and obviously we were and, and done quite well in, in the cup. So you, the first thing is you have to recover. You have to, you have to get your rest in and, and let your knocks heal. And any any problems you got, you need to address immediately. So you've got like a ten day, two week window to to do that. Um, obviously, it's important that you spend time with your family and, and your girlfriend or your wife or whatever. That, that that can't be underestimated because they're the people that, that make things happen for you. Mm. So you have to do that. But the days of having six weeks off getting drunk and, and eating what you want to eat, they're, they're, they're far gone. Um, we have a programme that we stick to. So the first two weeks will be really light, um, non-impact or swimming and your weights and, and your recreational sort of stuff, your golf, your tennis. We, we'll all be keeping busy doing that. And then you've got another couple of weeks where you'll probably go on a couple of runs each week. Um, and then after that, you know, you're on three, four runs a week and, and you are coming back probably fitter than you're going to end pre-season. But you have to get that balance right. You know, you have to you have to, you have have to to leave a little bit of improvement in yourself. Um, pre-season last year was, was great. The gaffer was really enjoyable. Obviously, we got to go away and play against a good side and, and obviously Real Madrid. So all that experience to this in good stead for the season. So... As I say, now now is like a downtime for us, but we will be coming back ready to, to hit the road running. So it is, it's a big time now, yeah. And do you ever have a kickabout with your mates or with some of the other players during the closed season, or is that forbidden? No, that, I think that is pretty much forbidden. Um, I don't think the club would forgive you if, if you went out and you playing in a stupid game with your mates and got injured. That, that That's a big no-no us. When I was younger, I used to. When I was sort of eighteen, nineteen, I used to do it. But but now, you know, the, the season's so long and, and so heavy. You need to stay away from from that and all that ball work and, and improving your technical side is, is definitely for pre season now. And um, I just wanted to ask you a bit about your interest in horse racing. I'm not yeah. by any stretch of the imagination an expert. My dad takes quite an interest. So, do you own a horse? Right. Yeah, yeah, I've got, um, there's, there's four of us who sort of got shares in a horse, yeah. Um, he's, a, he's a two-year-old, oh, he, he hasn't run yet, he's, he's just getting ready for a run sort of within the next month, so it's uh, it's something I've always had interest in. My, my dad's owned horses for well over 20 years now, and we've been fortunate to have some, some big days out with him, and uh, it's, it's been a big part of my life, you know. Everybody needs a release from football, and mm. and that's mine. Not 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 sort of just you know people associate horse racing with betting, but it's it's far deeper than that. My love of with horses, it, it goes to the breeding side of things, the pedigrees, and you know following horses in, in pattern races, and and uh, not only the jumps but the, the flat as well. So there, there's a lot to it that, that I take a lot of interest in. So that that's my release. 
And is that something yeah. you see yourself going into when you retire? Are you hoping to stay in the game? No, I, I think football football will be my life. You know, I, I want to stay in the game, and it's purely just a release for me and something that I take a lot of interest in away from football. But I see myself staying in the game. I know sort of every player probably well, probably seventy five percent of players say the same. You know, and there's so many few jobs in 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 the game, but. I do see myself as being a manager one day and and, and that is the route that I want to go. I've, I've been lucky enough to, to work with some real, real top-class managers and you feel if you can piece parts parts of them together and, and take parts out that you could hopefully use it to your advantage one day. And have you started doing your badges and all that stuff? Yeah, yeah, I got my first one done. Um, I've done that when I was quite young, but I think it's, it's, it's one of these things, you know, players say get them done early, but I think that could be a little bit foolish. I think the time to do it is when you're coming to an end and it's fresh in the memory. I think if, if I've done them now, then, then I'd forget what I learned tomorrow, you know. So I need to do it when the time's right and, and when I can put it into to full use. Good, man. Well, Tommy, I think I've taken yeah. up quite a lot of your time. You probably want to go and Thanks relax so. and enjoy your summer. So I'm just second half of QPR Wigan. So. <laughs> How's it going? Yeah. It's one nil Wigan. Oh, is it? Yeah, just started. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'm hoping uh, Wigan will go up because because uh, QPRs are, are much closer. I've got family up there as well, so it's much. Yeah, easier. yeah. Good man. All right. Well, enjoy the summer, yeah. and we look forward to seeing you next season. Perfect, Good man. Many thanks once again to Tommy for coming on the show. He told me just after we'd finished recording that his biggest moment of the season was the club keeping hold of Lewis Grabman in January. Well, it appears we haven't been able to keep hold of him for long, as tonight all sources report that we've accepted a bid for his goal-scoring services from our new championship college, Cardiff City. If you need a bit of cherry therapy following that development, don't forget you can listen to all the podcasts from the season just finished by checking out the website at www alldepartmentspodcast.wordpress.com You'll also find an archive of all last season's View from the Stands fan page from the award-winning Match Day programme, as well as suggestions on the different ways you can listen to the show. You can get in touch by emailing alldepartmentspodcast at gmail.com and follow on Twitter at All Departments. That's about it for now. The next episode should be out in just over a week. We'll play out with Jennifer Bastian's Cherry's Anthem, a ballad that's divided opinion ever since its release some years ago but one I can always be heard singing around the campfire in the closed season. So up the cherries in all departments, and goodbye! Here we are, here to stay, to play again another day. We have been a long time here, to survive another hundred years. Here we are, here to stay, to play again another day. We'll shout and sing.
are born with playing in style. We'll shout and sing the cherry song, and once again we will be strong. We'll shout and sing the cherry song, and once again we will be strong. We'll shout and sing the cherry song.